Bueno, empezamos esta segunda parte de, del debate, de la parte del videoforum. Eh, tenemos hasta las ocho y media, ¿vale? Eh, y bueno, si tenéis alguna pregunta, eh, aunque ahora vamos a crear un, un debate con varias eh, anotaciones que, que me ha apuntado, ¿no? pero si tenéis alguna pregunta que hacer, eh, también podéis levantar la mano y desde luego que podemos aquí conversar eh, mutuamente. Muy bien, Robin. Eh, de nuevo, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotras en esta tarde. No sé si podrías contarnos sobre tu experiencia en Ablobosí y en general en países africanos y asiáticos que hayas visitado, donde se produce pues, este movimiento ¿no? de, de residuos y productos electrónicos. Eh, bueno, decir que desde SETEM eh, hemos estado en Ablobosí y en, en parte también del país de Ghana y también conocemos Wiyu en China. Y bueno, nos gustaría tener tu punto de vista porque creemos que es un punto de vista muy a tener en cuenta en, en este aspecto y por contrastar también con el documental y que nos cuentes pues, tu gran experiencia a través de todos estos años ¿no? en, en este sector. Ok, uh, uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, muchas gracias por la oportunidad uh, de hablar en defensa de los importadores africanos. Uh, pero ahora me debes dos cervezas para, porque ahora la, es la tercera vez que tengo que ver la película E-Life. Uh, it's the third time I've had to watch this and it's particularly painful because uh, I was an advisor for Ed uh, Scott Clark, the producer. And uh, while I uh, am not critical of everything, In the film, uh, there is certainly pollution and there is certainly poverty. What I told him was the most important thing that he needed to do is to talk to the best and brightest and most intelligent people that I have ever met in electronics repair. And those are the African and Chinese people who come and buy it. They're in charge, they know what they're doing, and they needed to be interviewed. I felt so strongly about this that I used my own money to fly a particularly good technician to meet Mr. Clark in Florida so that he would at least let somebody who is buying the goods speak and explain himself. Unfortunately, you don't see any of the people who know the most about the business in this film. Um, Uh, I am not an expert. I'm flattered to be called an expert. But what I do is I, when I see a purchase order that somebody wants to buy something, I, I try to understand it. You know, I, I, I meet them and I say, why is it that you won't buy this thing that works at all? And that you will buy this one that doesn't work. You know, I, I, I show them two laptops. And I say, this one's missing all the keys. Why do you want this one? And uh, the Chinese gentleman says, because I have a factory that takes the laptops that we buy and removes all of the keyboards to put Arabic and Farsi keys on them. And I know that I can buy them from you for cheaper if they're damaged because I'm not competing with somebody. Anyway, that's just one of many examples. And my My concern is that the people who, because they're all families, you know, the, the nationality of the people in England who load the container, who buy it, they're selling to their cousins in Ghana. They're all on the same team. And they're communicating with, with each other with smartphones. If the person in London isn't sure if this is a good cell phone, they take a picture of it, they send it to their cousin in Accra and say, do you like this one? And they'll say, well, test this about it. And if every single one of you was a television, David, you can be a, a, a Sony. Maria, you can be a, a Sanyo. If every single one of you was a television and you wanted to live the longest life possible, what country would you live in? And here, If I could roll back on the film, 
the amazing thing I saw in Accra and at Agba Balashi, which they're calling the largest e-waste dump on the world, if you watch that video over and over, this is a city of five million people and there's two televisions at the dump. This is supposed to be sea containers. And when you get closer and you see the fires burning, that is automobile harness wire. Um, can you translate that? <laughs> it, inside of cars, junk cars, there's a lot of wire. And if you get close to the wire that they're burning, most of Egbogblashi is an automobile scrapyard. And again, it's a scrapyard of five million people, for a city of five million people. Um, is this the, yeah, if you run this behind me, what we saw in Accra is we were told there were 400 to 500 sea containers every month dumping there. I spent six weeks. You know how many sea containers we saw? Zero. So we started asking people, have you ever seen a sea container? And of all the people who live and work in Egbogblashi, the only sea containers they could describe were the ones that purchased plastic that they were shipping out of Egbogblashi. Everything that was arriving inside was coming from the, uh, this is some film of them. You see a little bit of it in the beginning of the film. They're uh, young men with push carts, like outside in Barcelona. You see these people with the shopping carts taking scrap metal from the city of Barcelona? That's what's happening in Accra. There, there are larger carts, but they go from business to business, house to house, they haggle and they buy. And once you follow that, then you see why in the first five minutes of the documentary, the only electronic monitors they can find are from the early 1990s. There's nothing visible in the film in Agbogblashi which possibly would have been imported by an African in the last 10 years. And that is why if you were a television and you want to live a long, long time, you want to be in a city where televisions don't die. And it's not because they don't have televisions. If anyone goes on your phone right now and looks up televisions per household in Ghana, it, in the city of Accra, it's, uh, uh, it was 83% of households had at least one television. When I lived in Cameroon, there were 300 TV stations in Africa, and that was in 1984. The, the, the Europeans, you know, when they got this story in their head that it's being purchased to be burned, and someone, the guy Jim Puckett, made up a number that 80% of what they buy is being dumped, well, there's nothing at the dump. Uh, why is it that, that uh, the African continent now has 170,000 mobile phone towers, but we don't see a single phone at the dump? To put up a phone tower, you have to have subscribers, right? You don't spend a million dollars per phone tower to put up 170,000 unless you have people who can do it. And the only explanation for it is that Africans are really smart at fixing stuff and making it work. Anyway, that's a little bit off script, but. You have no, tienes ahora el, el documental eh, detrás un poco para mostrar esto que precisamente comentabas. Yeah, this is uh, just, it, it's on YouTube. It's a 12 minute um, uh, a video done by Alex Wondergam, who I met, you know, in my travels. He lived in London and his parents were from Ghana. And he had heard about the biggest e-waste dump. So he, he went there, but he told me I couldn't find any sea containers. So I tried to follow where this stuff was coming from. And so he just follows some of these people that we meet and you can see them, there's no, there's no importer. The, the, the importers that they show you that are there are very smart about not buying anything that's waste. Uh, they're not used to people opening the TV and cutting the wires. That, that doesn't occur to them. 
<laughs> to them that I've got to open every TV because some crazy white person is cutting the wires. But if they do find a cut wire, they can fix a wire. Wires are not hard to fix. Muy bien, hablemos un poco sobre el convenio de Basilea que, que ha salido en el documental. Eh, bueno, conoces muy bien todo este movimiento de, de residuos y de aparatos electrónicos y eléctricos eh, y los intereses que hay al respecto, ¿no? tanto por los países digamos, que envían esos eh, residuos como los receptores. ¿no? Eh, al final, pues hay unos graves impactos ¿no? en, tanto en el medio ambiente como en las personas que están manipulando estos productos para poder ser pues, tanto reparados como reciclados. ¿no? lo cual es un papel fundamental también en esta parte de la reparación y reutilización. Lo que pasa es que bueno, al final no se tienen las herramientas adecuadas en, en estos países en vías de desarrollo y bueno, pues, sufren esas consecuencias de eh, esa manipulación de productos que pueden ser eh, tóxicos. ¿no? Eh, cuéntanos un poco desde tu experiencia sobre las vías por las que pasan estos residuos y estos dispositivos desde los países del norte global hacia los países del sur global y si crees que hay alguna solución eh, para que los países receptores no sufran todos estos impactos pero que a su vez también cumplen ese importante papel de reparación, reutilización y reciclaje, ¿no? Okay, well, first on the Basel Convention, uh, I, I, did do, I do have a degree in international relations. I did a semester in Geneva, and that's uncommon among recycling companies. Uh, but because of that, when this fellow that was interviewed named Jim Puckett of the Basel Convention, uh, or Basel Action Network, told everybody And The Economist listened to him, and CNN listened to him, and BBC listened to him, and he said that export for repair is illegal. I got a laptop. I looked up the Basel Convention. And the Basel Convention says not only is export for reuse legal, not only is export for repair legal, but under Annex 9, B1110, So long as no toxics are released under Annex 3, even recycling exports are legal. So I said, why are you telling everybody that it's illegal? And he said, because I support an amendment to make it illegal. And so I go on the internet, and for 20 years this guy has been promoting an amendment. That means to change the Basel Convention because he said that repair should not be legal. He's admitting that it is legal, but he disagrees and says it should be illegal. So I say, well, you were saying then that it is, that what these Africans are doing, because it's not white people putting it on boats. These are, again, Africans and Chinese and, and people buying for their own partners overseas. So what he did was said, 80% of it is being thrown away. That would be a violation of Annex 3. That, that would be illegal. But we can't find where he got that number. And I eventually got him to admit that the number 80%, when I said, where did you get that number? He said, uh, from CNN, <laughs> but CNN was quoting him. And when CNN quoted him, he was quoting BBC. But BBC was quoting him. In uh, New York, you see what, where this is going? The 80%, it, it doesn't exist. Now, what I trust is that that would be really stupid for an African to pay to ship something that's 80% waste because I've been inside the Tema, inside the customs agents. Tom there knows what it's like. Would, would you like to export 80% waste, Tom? <laughs> it's nothing but a headache if you're taking waste because you have to pay taxes on every single unit. They take apart and look at every single television. 
So that is why they're not being rejected. The, 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 uh, the shipper doesn't want it to be rejected. They don't want to pay taxes on something they can't sell. Uh, and so that is why under the Basel Convention, this is legal. And that solves the mystery. Why for 20 years it's been illegal, but the African customs keep saying to go in because it isn't 80% waste that was made up. Uh, and when you said uh, they don't have the tools to repair. The properly tools, the las herramientas apropiadas. There, there's no exposition to, to toxicity in, 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 in repair. I mean, what, what these people do, I, I've eyewitnessed it. We, we brought an author because some people started to listen to what I'm saying. We started to get universities to come and visit and say, Robin's right, these numbers don't make any sense. So in 2015, uh, uh, author Bloomberg, uh, Adam Minter, he wrote a bestseller secondhand. He came with me to see himself, and he brought a laptop with him that he wrote his first book on with no screen. Uh, the screen didn't work. And so I brought him to the repair shop to see, and they worked on it for an hour, hoping that it was the wires. And they said, no, we can't fix that here. He said, that's no problem. I see that you're very competent. They said, no, we didn't say it can't be fixed. We've just got to go to a competitor because this is a video chip. The integrated chip on the motherboard is a bad video. We don't have the chip replacement capacity in this repair shop. But they took his laptop to a competitor where they removed the motherboard, scan the video chip, and do board level repairs, replacing the IC chip with a new video chip on a motherboard. So that's why I question this idea that, oh, they can't do it over there. I don't know anyone in my hometown that can replace a bad video chip on a motherboard. Al final, precisamente esto que comentas de, de la reparación y de, de ese papel que se juega en, en, bueno, en países en vías de desarrollo donde este aprendizaje en las reparaciones es tan importante y que, como dices, incluso mejor que en, que en otros países desarrollados donde eh, no se llega a reparar tanto como, como en estos países. Eh, ¿Qué crees acerca de, de esta parte, ¿no? de, de ver cómo eh, hay veces que creemos que lo que eh, se envía a estos países pueden ser residuos como, mmm, como tal, ¿no? Como, como que no pueden llegar a tener una segunda vida, pero que en realidad eh, podemos estar considerando residuos cosas que no lo son? ¿no? ¿Cómo se puede hacer una exportación justa y bien hecha eh, de productos electrónicos y eléctricos para, para reparar? ¿Cómo se procede con, con esta exportación y si realmente es posible? Well, the, the, that, that's a great, great question. Uh, the very first thing to understand, and I hate to be saying this, but if you think about it, this is about racial profiling. Because Western press cannot seem to distinguish between a primary school dropout, an orphan who burns wires because he has no education and no job, and the very best student in the technical school who can change a chip. These people are both called Africans. It's labeled under this big African picture. As a school teacher for 30 months in, in Cameroon, I know the difference between the students that were brilliant and the kids who never went to school at all. The problem is that the Western press doesn't. That it doesn't occur to them that when they go to a place to interview about the imports, that there's no one there burning wire. What, what do they think that all of the kids got their pennies together to pay for a sea container so they could get things to burn? What I said at the beginning, 
that the missing thing when I flew, you know, this technician to go meet with Ed Scott is that if you can't see the difference between the genius and the person who burns wires because they don't even understand you don't make any money burning wires. Bur burning wires is associated with teenagers because they think, oh, the burned wire, I make a uh, dollar a kilo. If it's not burned, I only make uh, 70 cents, 70 centimes per kilo. Yeah, but it's not as heavy anymore after you burn it. You burn the casing off of it. And that's why you're only making $3 a day. It, it, th this is chronic unemployment is the issue. Uh, uh, and that's in country after country. Uh, I, that study uh, that I first heard about wire burning is associated with teenage unemployment and teenage boys because teenage boys like to burn wire uh, was done in Italy. That was a problem that they found in Na Naples. Why are, why are teenagers burning wire in this part of Italy and not that part of Italy? And it's because they've got nothing better to do. And oh, that's another anecdote I will tell you. Um, I actually know some of the people in these wire burning photos. I, I told you, that, hey, that guy in the orange shirt, his name is Yaro. I spoke to him on my uh, WhatsApp uh, last week. He was in a motorcycle accident, but he got, he got better. Um, they learned that when pe uh, white people with cameras come, that if they use twice as much gasoline accelerant, they make a bigger fire, that the cameras come to the person making the biggest fire. So when they're burning the wires and the cameras come, we see they're putting bigger and bigger fires because the, the white camera people are just like the teenage boys. <laughs> they want to come and take pictures of fire. Eh, yo lo he vivido también en, en persona, ¿no? Y sí que es cierto que al final en su día a día reciben visitas de, bueno, pues periodistas, eh, gente que quiere retratar, ¿no? Esa situación. Y, y que también esas personas eh, incluso te piden dinero por el hecho de grabarles ¿no? y crear también eh, lo que comentas, pues un fuego mayor o una situación a mostrar pues eh, quizás más, más fuerte de la que pueda ser, pero desde luego que su día a día, desde luego que la situación es la que es, eh, desde luego que, que estas personas están tratando con... Con, bueno, pues con la quema de cables, porque al final pues es el recurso que tienen ¿no? para sacarse su día a día. Y como bien decías, al final suelen ser personas eh, pues de una edad pues entre 12 y 30 y pico años, eh, gente joven, eh, chicos en su mayoría. Yo nunca he visto ninguna chica trabajando más que las que están eh, dando agua a estas personas y ayudándoles a pagar la quema de, de los fuegos. Y sí que es cierto que ha habido alternativas, ha habido algún proyecto para intentar evitar la quema de cableados y hacerlo con máquinas eh, donde se extrae por un lado el, la parte del metal, el aluminio y el cobre y por la otra el, el plástico ¿no? del encapsulado. Pero al final pues, eh, es difícil eh, este tipo de maquinarias y, y es mucho más costoso también en cuanto a tiempos. ¿no? Es más rápido eh, quemar directamente sin tener que desenredar todos esos grandes cableados eh, que tener que andar desenredando y pasándoles a través de una streetwire de, de máquinas de, de quitar el, el aislante, ¿no? el plástico. Eh, y bueno, pues al final suelen ser gente de la zona norte más empobrecida del país, ¿no? de toda la zona de Tamale y el norte de, de Ghana, que es precisamente donde está la zona pues, más empobrecida y que viajan a, al sur total de, 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 de Ghana, ¿no? en Acre, donde está Hablo sí. Para continuar, bueno, no sé si hay alguien que quiera preguntar antes de seguir a la, a la siguiente pregunta. Por allí tenemos... Eh, tenemos por aquí el, el micrófono, un segundo. Bueno, ¿se te oye bien? Está bien así, creo. Ah, ¿Hablo en inglés mejor? ¿Más fácil? Tiene traductor puesto ya. Sí, sí. Hola. Hola. ¿Me escuchan? 
Tienes que apretar, tiene un botoncito abajo con una luz verde. Y ya. ¿Aló? Ok. Uh, muchas gracias por, por, la, por la presentación. Uh, yo eh, a, ayer también hice una exposición yo, pero estaba trabajando con un proyecto en Macedonia del Norte, um, con comunidades romanas, uh, que también uh, recicladores informales, se dice, ¿no? Waste pickers en inglés. Um, y también estábamos, estábamos viendo la misma situación en la cual estaban comenzando, bueno, las comunidades quemaban los, esto, los cables para conseguir el cobre de dentro. Y según una encuesta de más de 500 personas, uh, esto de quemar cables no era una práctica muy común, pero sí se veía lo suficiente uh, seguido. ¿no? Y una cosa que pasaba es que el, un, la mayoría de sus ganancias no eran necesariamente del plástico o del... O del uh, ¿Cómo se dice? Cardboard. Cartón pero más bien era por el cobre adentro de los cables, especialmente cuando el precio del cobre internacional subía. Entonces, quería preguntar si ustedes también en su trabajo ves que el quemar del cobre, del cobre sucede con los precios internacionales, lo ven que cuando el precio internacional alza, también alza el, el quemar del, de los cables, porque en sí, bueno, en las comunidades romanas, Um, en, Norba, en Macedonia del Norte les afectaba mucho en su salud el quemar cables porque tiene muchos tóxicos y la gente los inhala ¿no? y en, entonces esto crea también contaminación local porque eso quema el aire y obviamente a las personas que a pesar que no estén involucradas en eso directamente también les, les impacta porque los contaminantes van por todos lados y bueno, quería saber eso un poco Well, um, 95 percent of us who sell wire don't burn the wire because we know the machines that they have. Uh, I could show you video. The, the places that buy wire in large volumes already have chopping machines. And then the wire goes into these water tables and the casings float off rather than being burned, and they actually manufacture things like shoe soles out of the, the wire casings. Uh, so there's no need to do it. So the people who do it are, when prices are very high, some of the buyers want to hide stolen wire uh, because people will go out at night and actually cut wire from the, uh, That, that's in use, and the buyers of the wire, you know, in Africa, don't want to be caught. You know, it's already been cut, so they'll say, burn this so that the police don't see that you stole the wire. Uh, the second reason, as I said, it's the people doing it are bored, like to stare at fire, and don't do the math that they're paid more for it, but there's less kilos of it. So they're not making any money, and that's why they're poor. And the third reason they burn wire is, as we said, because someone with a camera is there, and the more burning, the more the cameraman comes to you. No sé si alguien más quiere... Sí. Micrófono. Hola. Vale. I will try to repeat and be a bit more clear. Um, so uh, my question for you is, perhaps you could expand or clarify a little bit more. Um, for me, it's clear that you have uh, players like HP and Dell in these Western countries. 
um, trying to manage recycling in their own way. Um, but in, in these facilities in, in, in cities like Accra in Ghana um, and uh, other countries, they have their own players Okay, well, first, let me, I, I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but there's three things that, you know, I write about. I'm, I'm working on a book. Uh, one is planned obsolescence, which is if I'm HP or Dell, I don't want to be competing against my own product, you know, being refurbished and sold. Two is big shred. You know, once I invest in a million dollar piece of shredding equipment, you know, in London to get all this stuff, I can't compete in price against reuse. And the two of those, planned obsolescence and big shred, those industries, pay 90% of the money to the nonprofits that are advertising this problem. That's called the charitable industrial complex. Now, why are HP and Dell so concerned? D does anyone here remember the Optiplex, the Dell Optiplex? Okay, uh, about, when was that? 2004 to 2006, uh, Dell produced a lot of Optiplex computers that had a bad capacitor. They were bad caps, ca capacitors, that overheated and popped after about a year. And some of them got returned under warranty, but some people didn't get to warranty because there was these Chinese guys buying them. Because if you can get a rich person's broken thing that you know how to fix, so the Taiwanese were out there buying purchase orders for the Dell Optiplexes by the tens of millions. Dell told its own shareholders it had lost $300 million that year to sales of its own optiplexes that were purchased, brought back to Taipei. The, cap, the 50 cent capacitor was replaced, put back in a box, and sold. That was the year that the funding increased the greatest for the Basel Action Network. Uh, another group was uh, the ink cartridges, you know, when HP sells a printer. You know, I, I told an old business partner of mine who worked from HP, I said, I was looking at their books and 50% of HP's profits come from the ink cartridges. And my partner, Roberto, who uh, worked in Latin America, he laughed and he said, that's not true. It's more like 90%. <laughs> he said, we had to do all kinds of numbers to show, you know, buildings where we, because the, the ink cartridges were where all the money is. It costs about as much money as ballpoint pens to make those, and they sell them for $25. Well, what started happening? A Chinese factory started buying all the empty ink cartridges, refilling them, and relabeling them. Suddenly, HP is the biggest donor to uh, uh, the Basel Action Network. Um, uh, I, I often tell people about my, why I could recognize this. Uh, I come from a part of the USA that's very poor. Uh, Ozark Mountains, if you've heard of the Ozarks or Appalachia, uh, they, they were the last in the United States to have electricity. They were the least educated. They had terms like hillbilly for my grandparents. My, my mother's grandfather signed his name with an X. Uh, she grew up on a subsistence farm and I spent all of my summers on that farm where my grandfather told me, young man, you have to know how to fix everything. We can't afford to pay somebody else to fix things for us. And then he told me about how his family made money. 
He said when he was a boy of 10, his older brother, Charlie, was 10 years older, and Charlie told him that the cars, the Model A, the same thing always broke on them. It was the first thing to break was always the same thing. And he said there's a sound they make when that is breaking. So his brother told him, you know, nobody here in the mountains can afford a new Model A Ford. That's $1,000. Some of our neighbors will buy a used one for 500. But he told his younger brother, my grandfather, but come with me to St. Louis, come with me to Chicago, because if you listen and you know what's breaking, you can buy the rich guy's broken one for $200. And so they would find, you know, he would send the 10 year old, my grandfather out to listen and tell him, I hear it, I hear it. And then they would go and negotiate, buy that car, bring it to their barn, they knew it's the same thing. They fix it, buy it for 200, sell it for 500. And so when I went to Cameroon, you know, as a Peace Corps volunteer teacher, uh, wondering what do I hope my students will be doing, I saw people doing that. I saw them buying broken stuff, fixing it, and selling them to their neighbors. And that's when I recognized, if you've heard of a company called Acer, no one had heard, there was no Acer when I first met Simon Lin, the company, the CEO of Acer. He was buying back the cathode ray tube monitors from the 1990s, the CRTs, because he knew that they lasted 25 years, but Europeans and Americans were getting rid of them after four or five years. So he, was, he knew that they cost $110 to make brand new into a monitor. So he started buying all of the used CRTs, bringing them uh, to, to Taiwan and running them through the exact same factory that made the new monitors. Except that his monitors that he made, okay, they would only last 22 years instead of 25 years, but he was saving $100 on every monitor. That's really smart. Now he's a competitor. Within like four or five years, he, grew, he made so much money that he's now, Acer is now a competitor to Dell and HP. So the, the rise of, uh, and uh, Foxconn, uh, same thing, Terry Gu. So that's one of the saddest things for me when I see that the press can't tell the difference between poor, uneducated orphans burning wire and the technicians in Ghana that can replace the circuit, the chip on a motherboard, that those smart ones, those could be Acer. Those, I was around when China went from poorer than Africa is today to people like that, fixing rich people's stuff and growing so great that they became competitors. And that's what I think is, is the, the tragedy, the people in my part of the country, you know, got ridiculed and stereotyped and profiled as poor and uneducated. So when I see that happening to the tech students in Ghana, that, that really hits me right here. Because I think, you know, 15 years from now, we're going to be talking about, it'll probably be in solar panels. There's going to be some African who buys back all of the used solar panels that are being upgraded. He's going to become a billionaire. And you guys should remember I told you so. Because <laughs> that's where you make with just your intelligence. You know, all you have is your knowledge of how to fix that car, fix that phone. You know, there was a 16-year-old kid in Ghana that... A friend of mine tried to have his cell phone fixed in New York. He tried to have his cell phone fixed in uh, Netherlands. Nobody could do it. You know, he came with me to Ghana and brought it to somebody. And the first guy showed it to him. He said, I don't know how to do it, but I know someone who does. And the guy was 16 years old. And they found him and he said, yeah, I can fix it, but you can't look. <laughs> I, you have to, you know, stand behind this curtain because this is my thing. This is my thing that I know how to do. And this is how I make my money. And that kid fixed that guy's phone. So that, that's the job in emerging markets that's the most honest. 
you know, that's the, the way that you can benefit not just yourself, but your neighbors. And, you know, we, we don't have to be so afraid of burning wire that isn't even electronics wire, it's car wire. <laughs> you know, that we start to arrest people because everyone that got arrested, th there was like a, a, an eight year period when Interpol took this seriously and went out and started arresting people uh, for dumping. You know what they called it? The plan was Project Eden. That's what Interpol chose to, to create this thing to save Africa. Project Eden. Because of course, everything in an African city dump would only be a banana peel or a coconut shell. Any computer or TV we see in the dump must have been exported from us. So if we arrest the people exporting those things, Africa will be Eden. Every single person they arrested was African. Fortunately, I went to Lyon after several uh, protests to, to Interpol over this. And I came and there was a new person in charge of the program. She was from Romania. And she says, Robin, I'm new at this job, but my brother in Romania does exactly what you say. I can't say that we were wrong because that would jeopardize the funding for our program. That would jeopardize the people who work for me. We're just gonna be quiet and turn it off. So there are people, you know, that when you talk about this, you can reach the right person, you know, the, the authors, the, but, but the biggest thing is always listen for the smartest person in the room, the smartest person in the transaction. And that's somebody like my grandfather's older brother. Yo quisiera contestarte también a la segunda parte de la pregunta que has hecho. Eh, sobre qué podemos hacer, ¿no? Desde aquí decías que, que bueno, pues como personas consumidoras, que, que se puede hacer también desde, el, desde, bueno, pues desde Europa y países eh, desarrollados. Bueno, precisamente en CETEM es una de las líneas que, que, bueno, que estamos llevando en la campaña de, de electrónica justa y, bueno, venimos concienciando, como comentabas también, eh, a la gente, a la sociedad sobre los impactos que tiene nuestra electrónica, ¿no? Y desde luego que lo primero es reducir nuestro consumo, alargar al máximo la vida de nuestros dispositivos y, bueno, al final no hay móvil más ético que el que ya tienes y no te compras, ¿no? Aunque puedan haber soluciones también éticas de comercio justo, como el caso que hemos visto en, en el documental ¿no? de Fairphone. Eh, de hecho, hay también rankings que se pueden seguir, tanto para la parte de reparabilidad, fin de vida, como también para la parte de lo que estuvimos precisamente hablando ayer, de la parte de minería, de minerales libres de conflicto. Eh, digamos que hay diversas alternativas y desde luego que el primer paso es reducir y, y, y evitar comprar eh, hasta que no alargas al máximo tu dispositivo, ¿no? Pues intentar reparar a través de talleres como los que vamos a hacer mañana también eh, para poder dar una segunda vida a tu dispositivo. Y bueno, desde luego pues hacer incidencia política también sobre ello para intentar que que desde las administraciones eh, políticas pues, también se fomente eh, todo este tema de derecho a reparar, eh, desde la parte también de los fabricantes, ¿no? de los departamentos de ingeniería, pues intentar que se promuevan técnicas de codiseño para intentar diseñar desde el inicio de, del propio diseño del dispositivo teniendo en cuenta esa parte de fin de vida, ¿no? de, para ser fácilmente reparable, de manera que el diseño sea lo más modular posible, eh, pues empleando diferentes técnicas para que el diseño en sí tenga una fiabilidad alta y que pueda durar lo máximo posible y que además se ha tenido en cuenta también la parte del reciclaje desde el inicio del diseño, ¿no? para ser fácilmente reciclable, reciclable y poderse eh, pues eso, procesar de, de la manera más óptima posible. Es un poco pues, diversos puntos que podemos llegar a, a pues, hacer ¿no? para poder reducir esta parte de los impactos. No sé si queréis preguntar alguna cuestión más a Robin. Sí, por aquí. 
Thank you. Hola. En el botón verde. Hola. You broke it, Tom. <laughs> No tiene batería. You can speak here if you want. Hi, can you hear me? So I work in the circular economy, and I think there's a lot of things that go on that people don't realize. And you know, I, I recycle mobile phones. So I buy mobile phones from America, from Europe, Samsung's, Apple's, and I refurbish most of them in Ireland. So I have a big factory in Ireland. And I refurbish you know, a, what was a $400 phone. I get it for $100, not working. I replace the screen, maybe the battery. I then got a really good quality phone and I sell that across Europe. And I also sell those across Africa. And it's been harder and harder to do this because the, the, sort of, the big companies like Apple and Samsung label me as an e-waste producer. So I can't actually sell phones in South Africa now because I don't have an e-waste dumping certificate to, to take a really good high quality phone that's been refurbished. So it's much less um, environmental stuff gone into producing it. And I can't, now can't sell phones from Ireland into Germany because I don't have the right license. So, and also, they, they've gone away from licensing to now controlling the channels for sales. So, if, if I want to sell a refurbished phone in France on eBay or back market or um, uh, Amazon, if it's Samsung, I can't do it because Samsung's done a deal with Amazon and eBay to say that you can't sell reverse phones unless it's sold by Samsung themselves. So I can refurbish the Samsung for about a third the price that it costs Samsung to do it because you know, I've got more skilled people and we do it very cheaply in Ireland. But I'm being blocked and it's, I'm being labelled as an e-waste producer, but I'm actually a, a circular economy refurbishing company. So it's, I think... There's definitely, you know, we send a lot of phones to Africa. They're all working phones. We have about a 2%, 1% return rate. We give a two-year warranty on a refurbished phone in Africa. So if it breaks within two years, we will replace it free of charge. Um, that's way better than you can get from a Chinese phone. You know, they give a two-month warranty in Africa, or if that. And we also track the usage of our phones. So we, we do um, surveys to see what they're used for. We, See that you know, we give a lot of subsidised phones for aid projects for the UN, World Bank, stuff. Not the best organisations, but we we check that well, what they're used for. So our phones are, are given to women, disadvantaged women, given to teenage, unemployed teenagers to help them get access to te technology and training. They're given to farmers. One of the biggest use of our phones in Africa are for looking up diseases in goats. So when we ask them what they use it for, oh, they they used it to take a picture of their, their sick goat and got someone remotely to diagnose it and tell them how to treat it and saved it. And that's one of the major uses which we never dreamed would be used for. So I think the, the problems I see is the phones are, are not designed to be recycled. So it's very difficult to recycle, refurbish an Apple phone, almost impossible with some of the newer ones. Um, it's... And then the manufacturers want to sell new phones, so they're blocking my routes to sell refurbished phones. And the e-waste laws are being sort of used against refurbishing in the circular economy to stop me selling phones that are, are really good quality phones that have three or four years' life left in them. You know, some of the phones I sell are the, the best phones you can buy in some of the countries I sell them in, like I sell in Burkina Faso and Gambia. My recycled Samsung... A10s and A8s are sought after purchases because they're way better than the phones you can buy in country. 
So if the, it's getting harder and harder to sell them because of the misuse of e-dumping laws. Any comment? Uh, I, uh, an author used the term waste colonialization. Yeah. I've seen two authors use it. I like the way Adam Mentor uses it, which he says when uh, uh, a bunch of Europeans or people in power make rules about what a very intelligent African decides is the best thing for him to buy, himself to buy and that they create rules to limit that person's choice, that that's really a, a, a form of a co colonialism. And that the more people that my friends in Ghana are able to buy from, you know, if they can choose to buy from you or from back market or from Samsung or somebody else, the quality always goes up. The, the more choice they have and when you intimidate people from selling to Africa, like a lot of uh, recyclers, you know, just shred everything because they're like, I don't speak their language, I read something, I'm just gonna, gonna shred it. That that winds up giving the African less negotiating power. Somebody else who is willing to sell to them will say, well, I'm not gonna give you these three good ones unless you take this bad one too. So, the, the, if you're dealing with somebody as smart as the people I deal with, I'm in favor of giving those people the most access to the market that they can have and to stop pretending that we know more than they do. Nos da tiempo a una preguntilla más antes de finalizar, que ya van llegando las ocho y media. Eh, no sé si alguien quiere hacer una última pregunta para concluir. ¿Ninguna pregunta más? Muy bien, pues si no hay preguntas... Eh, Simplemente agradeceros el, el que hayáis podido venir hoy a este video forum, eh, bueno, donde hemos podido ver también pues, diferentes perspectivas ¿no? y no quedarnos simplemente con, con un documental entre otros muchos más que, que hay acerca de este, esta parte de fin de vida. Eh, hemos querido crear este debate también para ver todas las perspectivas desde todos los puntos y también el papel fundamental de las reparaciones, ¿no? de, del poder reutilizar para poder evitar al máximo eh, estos residuos. ¿no? Y ahora, ahora mismo, además, tan importante con todo el tema de la minería, eh, eh, la minería urbana, ¿no? el, el poder llegar a cerrar el círculo de la economía circular y poder llegar a extraer estos, residuos directamente, perdón, estos minerales directamente de los residuos. ¿no? Eh, más aún con esta crisis de semiconductores que estamos viviendo hoy en día, ¿no? donde no es difícil, ¿no? donde no hay muchísimos dispositivos electrónicos como venían habiendo en abundancia estos años atrás. ¿no? Cada vez vemos que más fábricas de trenes, de automóviles eh, tienen grandes parones por escasez de, de semiconductores, eh, no hay videoconsolas, no hay... Muchos tipos de electrónicas que, que, bueno, al final estamos viendo que este nivel de consumo es insostenible y que es difícil eh, pues tener tanta oferta para tanta demanda de, de consumo. ¿no? Eh, terminamos aquí. Recordaros que eh, mañana tenemos a las 11 eh, una Restart Party, eh, Install Party y también eh, bueno, un juego de los derechos humanos, eh, vamos un taller de con juegos infantiles y eh, también una exposición del, del ciclo de vida de la electrónica. Agradecer de nuevo a Robin que haya podido venir y bueno, pues por, por poder haber tenido esta, esta charla eh, con todas nosotras y nosotros y, y bueno, mañana seguimos. Quería comentar ulti, un último punto y es que eh, tenemos, eh, bueno, quien está interesada, tenemos unos papeles fuera sobre un te el tema de las alegaciones de no a la mina de Cañaveral en Cáceres. Eh, bueno, no sé si sabéis que en esta zona de Cáceres 
hay una gran reserva de litio y donde se están proyectando pues, difer diferentes proyectos. Eh, esta plataforma de no a la mina de Cañaveral ha realizado unas alegaciones que están en plazo hasta el 15 de marzo, entonces desde eh, la ciudadanía se puede apoyar. Tenemos los papeles en la entrada, quien quiera eh, apoyar estas alegaciones eh, se puede pasar por, por la mesa de la, de la entrada. Muchas gracias.